Shortly before 1700 BCE, a dire catastrophe struck Kemet conquest by dreaded foreigners. These invaders were designated by Mantheo, a Comitian priest historian, as the Hyksos, loosely interpreted to mean king shepherds or rulers of foreign lands. Unexpectedly, from the regions of the east, invaders of obscure race marched in confidence of victory against our land. By main force, they easily seized it without striking a blow, and having overpowered the ruler of the land, they then burned our cities ruthlessly, razed to the ground the temples of the gods, and treated all the natives with a cruel hostility. Finally, they appointed as king one of their number, whose name was Salidas. Their capital, Avaris, was located in the delta region of the country. They were, for many years, strongly entrenched in Lower and Middle Egypt. A reawakening of native Comitian power, led by families from the Upper Comitian area of Waset, occurred approximately 1625 BCE. This occurred during what was considered the 17th Dynasty. Their king, Sekinere, gathered an army which utilized the services of Nubian mercenaries, the Medje. For the first time in Kemetic history, he evicted the hated Asiatics. The Comitians were now armed with new types of superior weapons, such as different kinds of bronze swords, daggers, powerful compound bows, and for the first time employed the horse and chariot. Sakana Ray's mummy, which survives to this day, reveals that he died a violent death, probably at the hands of the Hyksos. Sekonere's son and successor, Kamos, continued the struggle for freedom. He sailed down the Nile toward Avaris to liberate Kemet. He secured a great victory in his first battle at Nefrusi, where the use of horses is recorded for the first time in Comitian annals. Two stelae commemorate Kamos' struggles against the Hyksos and their vassals. It would, however, be Kamos' successor, either his brother or nephew, Amos, 
who would finally succeed in overthrowing the Hyksos in 1522 BCE. And with his reign, a new period of prosperity and wealth would begin, the 18th dynasty, the New Kingdom. In an effort to secure the Comitian borders against future invasions, almost conquered a territory stretching from Syria, Palestine in the north to the second cataract in Nubia in the south. In a small period of time, Kemet became the most powerful nation in ancient Near East. Ahmosis' aggressive policies against Asia and Nubians was followed by his successors, especially Tutmosis I and Tutmosis III. With Tutmosis I, a new family ascended to the throne. It is thought that the royal line continued through Amos, Tutmosis I's principal wife. He launched a series of campaigns that allowed him to bring back bounties, which created a wealth in Kemet unlike anything it had ever seen before. Tutmosis I was the first pharaoh to be buried in the Valley of the Kings, a tradition that would be followed until the end of the New Kingdom. Tutmosis I was succeeded by his son, Tutmosis II, who died after a brief reign, leaving an infant son, Tutmosis III, to inherit the empire. Tutmosis III was the sixth reigning pharaoh of the 18th dynasty for 54 years from 1479 to 1426 B.C. He is regarded as the greatest warrior pharaoh of ancient Kemet. He ascended the throne around the age of 10 years. At the death of his father, he shared the co-regency with his stepmother, Hapshepset. Tutmosis III was Tutmosis II's son by a minor queen named Isis. Since Tutmosis III was so young, Hapshepset relegated him to an inferior position for 22 years while she ruled as pharaoh. After her death, he emerged as the sole ruler of Kemet. Tutmosis III immediately began great military campaigns to reestablish Egyptian supremacy in Syria and Palestine. He had all of the qualities of a brilliant general and also excelled as an administrator and statesman. He was an accomplished horseman, archer, and athlete. With all of these extreme talents, he created the largest empire that Kemet had ever seen. He engaged in 17 military campaigns, never losing a battle. Tutmosis III is reported to have captured 350 cities during his rule conquering much of the Near East from the Euphrates to Nubia. His campaigns are transcribed onto the walls of the Temple of Amun at Waset. This great pharaoh transformed Kemet into an international superpower that stretched from southern Syria through to Canaan and Nubia. The world can thank his royal scribe and army commander, Thunani. He wrote about Tutmosis III's military achievements, conquest, and reign. After years of military campaigning were over, he established himself as a great builder pharaoh as well. Tutmosis III was responsible for building over 50 temples all over Kemet. He brought artistic skills to extremely high levels during his reign. He commissioned the building of many tombs for nobles, which were made with the greatest of craftsmanship. Tutmosis III's architects and artisans' use of pillars in beautiful buildings was unprecedented. Overall, his reign was a period of great stunts. This great pharaoh ruled 53 years, 10 months, and 26 days. Tutmosis III's tomb was built in the Valley of the Kings. It was discovered in 1898 by Victor Lorette. It was the first tomb in which Egyptologists found the complete Omduet or the book of what is in the netherworld. Tutmosis III's impact in propelling Kemet into a world power in ancient history is profound. He was a national hero who was revered many centuries after his time. His name was held in highest esteem long after the last days of ancient Kemetic history were gone. Besides his extraordinary military achievements, he carried out great artistic projects across Kemet. He has more than earned his place in history as the world's first great conqueror.
Pharaoh Amos. Amos is dressed in the shinlet kilt of pleated white linen and held up by an ornamental beaded belt fastened by a gold clasp. On the richly decorated head fillet is the Uraeus serpent, which was the symbol of royalty. In his belt is the two-handed sword, which was cast in a single piece of bronze. The axe carried has a gilded bronze blade, which is secured to the cedar wood handle by gold wire. The blade design is in blue enamel and depicts a horse and rider. The sandals are of red leather and gold. Officer. This man wears an upper linen dress and a kilt with a puffed out front piece characteristic of the 18th dynasty. He carries a staff and wears a long wig. The gold collars and golden fly are decorations received from the pharaoh as recognition of military achievement. The sandals are of plated rushwork. Infantryman. This spearman carries a round top shield of wood, painted and bearing the insignia of the royal house, and is evidently a guardsman. The spearhead is fastened to the shaft by nails and bound. The battle axe, or Akas, was the most characteristic of all New Kingdom weapons, had a slender, whippy haft, and may have been used as a throwing weapon. This was used by infantry and marines to dispatch enemies laid low by missile fire. The blade was of bronze. Syrian Chariot Warrior This man wears a helmet of leather strips with a tail of horsehair. Over the characteristic long garment is a curious of metal scales sewn to a leather jerkin. A is an alternative style of helmet and the warrior wears a medallion. B is the rectangular buckler of leather covered wood embossed with metal nails and with an extra protective piece at the top. Horseman. This scout or messenger wears a wig and fillet. His kilt is of cut leather with an additional leather patch at the seat for protection. He is armed with bow and arrows to enable him to fight from the horse if need be. He rides the horse bareback and sits well back. High-ranking officer. This man wears a curious of four-inch bronze scales sewn onto a leather or linen jerkin. The scales were sandal-shaped and had an embossed ridge down the center for strength. This type of curious was normally worn only by high-ranking officers of the palace guard and royalty. Daggers were now of more slender proportions and some had ribbed blades and an ivory pommel. The handle was an inlaid grip of wooden plates. He carries his staff of office and wears leather sandals. Hyksos Chariot Warrior These Semitic warriors wore an embroidered woolen tunic and a broad belt over which was worn a long cloak. The leather helmet had flaps to protect the ears and a projecting piece at the back covering the nape of the neck. They were bearded and armed with spear and dagger and wore sandals with leather ankle straps and heel piece. Canaanite Spearmen Canaanites from southern Palestine 
wore either a kilt-type garment from waist to knee or a longer garment secured over one shoulder. This warrior wears a cap of leather or thick material with a frontal band. He wears sandals and carries dagger and spear. Canaanites are sometimes shown wearing banded armor of either metal or leather. General, this man, a royal prince, commanded an army division. He wears an artificial youth lock of leather and stiffened linen and the long garment of this dynasty. He carries a single ostrich feather as a sign of his rank and is armed with a small axe which was suspended head down from the belt. His garment is of white linen with a wrap-around linen girdle. Chariot Warrior All chariot warriors were armed with a bow, a composite one in this case, but which could have been made of yew. He wears a bronze scale curious with two-inch by one-inch scales, which had been reduced from the earlier size of four-inch for flexibility and lightness. The size was decreased, but the number of scales was therefore increased. The horizontal bars of metal plates were secured by bronze pins and the sleeves went almost halfway to the elbow. The quilted linen helmet without tassels, peculiar to charioteers and spearmen, descended to the shoulders and was fringed with leather. The front was a separate piece. The chariot warrior's badge of office was attached behind him on a broad belt. Heavy Infantry The curious of padded linen or horsehair extends almost to the knee and is tightened by a girdle to prevent the weight of it pressing on the man's shoulders. His helmet descends to the ear and has an additional piece to protect the nape of the neck. The pointed summit bears two tassels colored black, green, or red. The pole axe was about three feet long and had a blade from 10 inches to 14 inches long and two inches to three inches wide. The four inch diameter bronze ball provided the weight for this formidable weapon which no shield or armor could withstand. Heavy Infantry Over the linen Harbick is worn a cuirass of thin leather strips held in place by braces pressing over the shoulders and extending to the waist. The padded helmet is a rounder shape and does not cover the ears. These helmets were usually white with red stripes. The triangular front piece of the white linen kilt is of stiffened linen to offer protection below the cuirass. The mace was similar to the pole axe but had no blade. It was made of wood bound with bronze and had an angular piece of metal projecting from the handle to serve as a hand guard. In addition, he carries an eye axe which has been introduced to combat armor and helmet. The round top shield with parallel sides has a round depression near the top to take a bronze boss particularly indicating the unit's name and is edged with leather studded with bronze nails. Heavy Spearmen These men wore the same helmet as the chariot warriors. The short cuirass is either of padded linen or horsehair with a stiffened linen lappet for protection of the groin. At this period, all spear, javelin, and arrowheads had tubular sockets 
which fitted round the shaft and extended along the blade to form reinforcing mid-ribs to give added rigidity and a stronger union. The spear butt socketed like the head was 10 inches long and circular in section. The shield was strengthened by one or more rims of metal studded with bronze nails. In this case, the handle is situated so that the arm can pass through it to grasp a spear. The kepesh with bronze curved blade was ideal for hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Heavy Archer Heavy archers wore a cuirass of studded leather which extended to the knees. Alternatively, this man could have worn a metal scale cuirass as he was unable to carry a shield. The padded helmet extends to the shoulders and is fringed at the base. The quiver was supported by a belt passing over the shoulder and was slipped into a horizontal position in order to draw out the arrows beneath the arm. The leather wrist guard was secured to the arm by a thong tied above the elbow. Light Archer This man, protected only by a padded linen helmet with tassels, carries a composite bow which has been introduced by the Hyksos and was a powerful long-range weapon up to six feet long. It was constructed of layers of horn glued to front and back of a grooved wooden core, bound with birch bark, and required the toughest sinews for the string. The bow case depicted is a sheath with open ends which was put round the bow when held in the hand on the march. The battle axe shown had a shortened head and a narrower cutting edge. Slinger. He wears no protection with the exception of a quilted helmet with tassels. The sling was of plated leather thongs and the stones were carried in a linen or leather bag. The weapon carried in the belt is a simple mace which was merely a stout stick bound with bronze wire and provided with a handguard. Light Javelin Man. This man wears no head protection so wears his hair in a great shock. The shield strap could be lengthened to enable the shield to be slung on the back for ease in marching or protection. Some shield handles were perpendicular but the horizontal one was the more usual type. The javelin cases were made of spotted bull's hide like the shield but were not provided with straps as they were carried on the shoulders by members of the ammunition parties. The kepesh shown was carried by both light and heavy troops. Standard Bearer The officer shown carries the divisional standard of Amun, beneath which is a small figure of the pharaoh and bears the rank of standard bearer of the army. The badge worn round his neck is of two lions and was the emblem of courage. His only protection is a quilted helmet and an eye axe. Trumpeter the trumpeter always gave the signal to attack by blowing a number of blasts on the instrument. The trumpet was 18 inches long and made of copper or bronze and sometimes silver. He also carries the wooden trumpet former, which was inserted when the instrument was not in use. This was in order to maintain the shape of the fragile instrument and could also have been an aid in cleaning. He wears a padded helmet, but carries no weapon. The long drum used on the march was carried by means of the shoulder strap. Drummers were dressed the same as the trumpeteer and were usually stationed behind the standard bearer.
standards. During the New Kingdom, the old known standards became regimental ensigns and were augmented by other military and naval innovations. These standards were either of painted wood or metal or a linen-covered wooden framework. They were mounted on a long pole and usually had colored streamers attached to the device. Most standards had a wooden stand to fix them upright or a pointed metal butt to fix them to the ground when not being carried. This was the commonest form and was confined to military and naval use. This standard of painted wood was identical in appearance with the flabellum of ostrich feathers, which was an object of state born behind the pharaoh. Usually it was painted to imitate colored feathering, but was sometimes of solid red color. The streamers were red or red green. The rectangular standard was usually colored yellow, but was sometimes white or red. The cartouches would bear the royal name, but an alternative device could have been the name of the corps represented. The ostrich feather signified victory, and the ensign was also streamered. This device represents the Dejed pillar surmounted by the sun disk and plumes and probably represented men recruited from Abydos and probably also referred to the localities from which the men were recruited. In that case, the former would also signify Abydos and the latter most certainly Hermophis. This is a parade standard bearing in a cartouche the prenomen of Hepsepsis, the lion in and fan surmounted by horns carried by marines, and Uray. was probably painted the same as with the lion in yellow. The falcon and ostrich plume was another naval standard with the feather in the white and the falcon in brown, yellow, and white. Egyptian Chariot The chariot greatly developed by the Aryans through military necessity in northern India was introduced into Egypt by the Hyksot about 1600 BCE. The rounded body rested on the bent wooden pole and was further secured by leather thongs from the top rail. The pole inserted into the axle serving as a spring and at the other end carried a bow-shaped yoke of horn beams. The light six-spoke wheels were set far back for weight distribution, were equipped with leather tires, and were strengthened at the spoke joints with brawn bands. Quivers and javelin cases were lashed to the sides and were inclined backwards for easy access from the vehicle. The bow case was so placed that when the bow was withdrawn, the flap fell back down. Royal chariots were highly decorated and covered in sheet gold and precious stones. The pharaoh's chariot bore on the pole the solar hawk, which denotes the royal house. The Egyptians had modified the chariot with lightness as the main object and the weight and length had to be reduced so that a man could carry one on his shoulders if need be. Syrian chariots were very similar to Egyptian models, except that the wheels had only four spokes instead of six. Egyptian Chariot Horse these horses were slender and sinewy animals with narrow hindquarters and a flowing tail. The hiktar, or span of horses used to pull a chariot, was always white in the case of royalty and high-ranking officers and were stallions whenever possible. Some of the line chariot horses wore a protective housing of linen, or leather in some cases, and also a padded housing to protect the head. The harness mainly consisted of a broad breast band, which was surmounted by a bronze knob, which bore a small hook to
to secure the bearing rein. A thinner strap pressed under the body and was secured to the breastband. Spur-shaped goads were attached to the breast harness to prevent the horses from breaking the line of draught. Egyptian horses wore blinkers, which were engraved with the god Sutut. In most cases, harness and leatherwork were purple in color. Line chariot horses sometimes had rosettes fixed to the bridle or simply a spray of artificial flowers. Royal horses bore a golden crest on the head housing, which held ostrich feathers carried only by the ruling house. The body housing of the pharaoh's chariot horses was highly decorated and bore tassels, and the harness was decorated with golden plaques. Medje Standard Bearer. These were the best auxiliaries that the Egyptians recruited from Nubia. They were employed as infantry and scouts and were also used as a kind of police force and border patrol. As he is an officer, the Standard Bearer wears a linen loincloth and a wig. In addition to the Standard, which also shows a gazelle and ostrich feather, he carries a battle axe and sling. Nubian chief. This man wears a long loincloth held in place by a wide cloth girdle, highly decorated as is the broad band crossing the body and passing over the shoulder. From the girdle hangs a leather lappet flanked by rows of beads. He also wears as decoration a beaded necklace, metal armbands, gold bracelets, and panther tails tied to his arms. He also wears two feathers as a sign of rank. Nubian Archer. This man wears a panther skin wrapped around his body with the tail hanging free and held in place by a broad belt. He is armed with the characteristic double curved bow of Nubia, which was a powerful weapon. Nubia provided the Egyptian armies with auxiliary archer units from the earliest times. Nubian infantrymen. This primitive looking warrior is armed only with a curved hardwood club and for defense carries a bullhide shield. He wears a short patterned loincloth with a leather lappet in front and a beaded necklace. Other Nubian infantry were armed with a spear in place of the club. Nubian high-ranking officer. This man wears a white leather kilt held in place by a highly ornamented broad leather girdle. Over his shoulder is a leopard skin with the tail hanging down behind him. In his hair are two feathers and he also wears gold earrings and bracelets. He carries no shield but is armed with a spear and hardwood club. Karu Auxiliary. These men from Palestine wore a long loose robe of wool which extended to the ankles, had ample sleeves, and had a broad girdle. They had a large beard and wore a skull cap which was terminated by a band falling down behind and ending in a tassel. The weapons carried were a composite bow and either a spear or two javelins. 
The double belt crossing each shoulder bears a resemblance to the later Assyrian dress. Amorite Spearmen The area which was later to be called Palestine was divided into Amor in the north and Canaan in the south. This northerner wears a characteristic head fillet with a bow at the back. His woolen loincloth reaches almost to the knee, is highly patterned and decorated with acorns, and is held up by a broad belt. He is armed with spear and dagger, but could alternatively be an archer. Timihu Libyan. These men wore ostrich feathers and had a long tress of hair hanging down to the shoulder. Over the loincloth, they wore a long open garment fastened at the shoulder, highly decorated and with only one sleeve. They were mostly spearmen. Tehenu. Libyan. This Libyan tribe from further west were tall and muscular with a thick head of hair falling down the back and onto the chest and had a plaited beard. They wore material bands crossing the chest and necklaces and pendants. From the decorated belt hung a phallus sheath of leather as well as protectors for the hips and rear. An animal tail was suspended from the back of the belt. Hittite Chariot Warrior The characteristic Hittite tunic was short-sleeved and patterned bands at the sleeves and neck. It reached to the knees and was of wool or linen, which was dyed various colors and ornamented with a fringe. In the leather waist belt studded with metal was carried a curved dagger with crescent pommel. The high boots with pointed toes were probably of leather and were really snowshoes. The warrior wears a leather helmet with a form of visor which is curved up at the nape of the neck. He has the Hittite pigtail and square cut beard. In addition to the bows and arrows, a spearman was carried in the chariot for the close fighting. Most chariotmen, however, were armed with spears only. The Hittite Axeman. This infantryman wears the lofty tiara of felt or leather with a turned up brim, which was either pointed or rounded in the sugarloaf shape as shown. A long dagger or sword is carried in the belt, and he carries the Hittite double-headed axe. This must have been a formidable weapon and was probably wielded by both hands. He wears large earrings and a square-cut beard. Hittite Guardsman the metal or probably leather helmet has ear pieces and an extended piece to cover the nape of the neck. A reinforcing bar on the summit holds a plume, possibly of horsehair, which hangs down the back. This man wears no tunic, but a highly decorated kilt held by a broad studded belt.
was born in the Congo. I walked to the Fertile Crescent and built the Sphinx. I designed a pyramid so tough that a star that only glows every 100 years falls into the center, giving divine, perfect life. I am bad. I sat on the throne to be connected with Allah. I got hot and sent an ice age to Europe. Thank you. 